This is you all. I'll make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I can make a C plus feel like a Congressional Medal of Honor, and I can make an A minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything less than your very best? You want to know what I make? I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute silence. No, you cannot work in groups. No, you can't ask a question. So put your hand down. Why won't I let you go to the bathroom? Because you're bored and you don't really have to go, do you? You want to know what I make? I make parents tremble in fear when I call home at around dinner time. Hi, this is Mr. Molly. I hope I haven't called at a bad time. I just wanted to talk to you about something that your son did today. He said, Leave the kid alone. I still cry sometimes, don't you? And it was the noblest act of courage that I have ever seen. I make parents see their children for who they are and who they can be. You want to know what I make? I make kids question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write, 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 and then I make them read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, over and over again until they will never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show all their work in math and then hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them realize that if you've got this, then you follow this. And if somebody tries to judge you, Based on what you make, you give them this. Let me break it down for you. Let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. I make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? So, in my mind's eye, I came here because you guys make a huge difference. There's a more PG version of that on YouTube that doesn't have this, but I send you away with make a difference, okay? Hey, thank you. And can you put up my info up there so people can see it on that one slide before we jump over there? I tweet a lot, and I don't follow many people, but I'd say 30, 300 of those are ice hockey coaches, 300 of those are golf coaches because we talk about things like Here's the ice hockey actual reality of the percent of chance 6.3 to be from high school in D3 and D1 at 4.0 or whatever. So follow me on Twitter or do something to uh, reach out to me by email and I'll be happy to respond. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. Fantastic. Okay, I'm not, uh, I'm not here to teach you about coaching. I'm going to go back just with a, a fun little idea before we go to break and then a whole bunch of breakout sessions. Uh, a lot of that was about think different about what you do, think different about the role of coach. And uh, just a quick little story about a guy who thought different about something that we all deal with every day. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of dollarshaveclub.com. What is dollarshaveclub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades, an aloe vera lubricating strip, and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. <laughs> So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu-jitsu, I drive like a gangster when I'm coming to see you, see you.
do I show you that? Well, for one simple reason. Mike and a buddy of his were sitting around having a beer in California in 2014. And they were complaining about the price of razor blades, which, as you know, is a business and a model that was built by Gillette. And the model is, who dominate the market. And the model is, we're basically going to give you the razor for free, and then we're going to charge you just an insane amount of money for the refill blades. But once you've got our razor, you can only buy our blades to fill it up. It's worked very well for them. Uh, Gillette's a company owned by Procter & Gamble, a big multi-billion dollar business. So Mike and his buddy are sitting complaining about this, going, there's got to be a different way. So they figured out this idea of why don't we have a subscription razor blade thing. They found a way to get the blades made really cheap. They put that ad up on the internet at a cost of whatever the cost of the ad was, next to zero. They got 15,000 orders in the first 48 hours, did 10 million bucks of business the first year, 100 a couple of years later, sold the business last year to Unilever for one billion dollars. One billion dollars. Now you may not come up with a hockey idea that's going to make you one billion dollars, but I show you that thinking you're going to have a lot of time sitting around with your team. Some of you, I heard a lot of you from the same schools, so there's a bunch of you here. And I think what John was just saying is challenge some of the things that are the way they are just because that's the way they are. We put kids through drills because that's the way I was taught to play hockey. Maybe think a little different about it. Some of the people you're going to meet here, you're going to have a beer with over the next couple of days. That might be the place where you come with a great idea that can help your program. Be open to the possibility. All right, it's time for a break, and then we're going to move to breakout sessions. Here's the way it's going to work after you grab a quick coffee. Uh, starting in just a couple of minutes in here, the men's champion panel is going to uh, collect, and then the women's breakouts are going to happen outside of here in rooms over here. And you can see this on your thing. Dan Tudor is going to be in Chocoloski. Jay Riley is going to be in Imokali. And John Colin is going to be Imokali North. Uh, Jay Riley on financial planning is, is in Imokali L&M. Uh, you go to two of those for 20 minutes each, rotate around them, and then starting at 11.50, it's going to switch, and the women's champions panel is going to be in here, and then simultaneously, Dan Tudor is going to do his recruiting again in Chocoloski, Jay Riley Financial Planning in Amokali uh, L&M, and uh, John Cole in Coaches, Inc. in Amokali North. Everyone got it? It's, up there. it's out there on the boards if you didn't get that. Uh, have a grab a quick coffee and a bio break, and uh, we'll see you tonight at six o'clock again as a group for the um, party uh, cocktails out on the lawn, and the trade show opens, the exhibit opens, and uh, that great exhibitor gift is going to be here. And thank you to all our exhibitors. See you later tonight.
Pinera. Uh, I should have called a timeout. I had a group out there that was tired, and they weren't playing that well. We were shorthanded, and I didn't call it, and I hesitated. Sure enough, Skidmore gets the goal, and then they win the game, and afterwards, I did admit I screwed the whole game up. Well, anyway, the next night we played Castleton at Castleton. We started out poorly, and we had three of our top players hurt. We came back, we won the game five to nothing, and that was my 700th win. So it was kind of emotional in the locker room, and the kids, you could just feel a good sense that we were ready to go. And we didn't lose a game the rest of the year, which was very special, and... Uh, I think, you know, um, the other thing is any time you walked in the locker room, I felt good. You know, the kids were having a great time. They were enjoying each other. They were there early all the time. And I did read one of the coaching books I read this summer. I read about ten books. And uh, one of them about leadership was um, you should spend more time in the locker room. I always walked through the locker room once in a while and talked to the guys, but not a lot much. I started going in a little early. I'd sit down on one of the benches and start shooting the ball with the kid. I was, they went, and I think it eased things up a little bit, and I kind of enjoyed it more, getting to know the kids. And uh, they were a great group, and we had certain great leaders, and I think that uh, I kind of get that feeling as the season was going on. Uh, we, we were going to have success. It's going to be a quiet group in here today. We've got to get some hands up here. Any questions? Yep, Rick. Uh, for us, I, I thought that uh, it's important that your leadership group has their own voice, that they're in conjunction with your message, but they give it in their own terms. And we've been really fortunate. Uh, I think Grant Arnold was an incredible captain for two years, and I give him most of the credit for changing the culture of a, into a real we team first attitude. And I think that Will Butcher was the perfect complement to replace him. But our entire senior class was, I mean, we didn't, and maybe we had three below average practices all year, and it's because our, I thought our seniors played with a lot of, um, they knew it was their final year and they knew they had a chance. And their purpose and their holding their teammates accountable was very impressive. We had co-captains and we, um, you know, I was, all my most, 90% of my teams have been, you know, have one captain, one leader, everybody falls under him. But the co-captain thing the last couple of years we've done has worked very, very well. I had a, two different personalities. I had a five foot four, uh, Tyler P. Santini, who was just uh, an, an energy bunny, you know, unbelievable kid, good skills. He was on YouTube. He got, he got one of those big goals against Middlebury where he fancied around about two guys and snuck it upstairs in his backhand before I know it. 50,000 people are watching the thing on YouTube. So um, he, he uh, had that certain personality that you looked at him, and he was a pain in the ass as a player to play against. He, he was tough, tenacious, and he always could figure out how to get the winning goal or assist or whatever, block shots, anything you want. So I, I was blessed with that. And the other kid, Austin Soroak, was a big kid, big, strong kid, a very, very bright kid who represented the school and did all the speaking. <laughs> we had to have speaking uh, engagements. And uh, they really captivated the locker room. They, did a, uh, they, they came in and met with me at least twice a week. And if there was any concerns, we had a great line of communication. And, uh, and there were a lot of kids in the uh, locker room that didn't have A's or letters that I thought, deservingly so, uh, were great leaders. So I think it spread. It just, the culture spread. Stevie Matson, my assistant coach, I don't know where the hell he is, probably out on the beach, but he brought in a lot of good kids. He did. He did a great job of bringing in uh, some wonderful uh, guys. You know, people talk about the kids, how they change today and all that. I think they're fabulous. And of course, when you have a great team like we did this year, it's always easy to say that. But in general, coaching over the last uh, 20 years or so, I think they're, they're great. So they, a lot of, like you guys said, all of a sudden it's in the locker room. They're doing it, and 
you feel like they're running the show, and off they go. Um, for me as a young coach, um, I've been fortunate to be around a lot of great mentors uh, so far in my young career. And uh, Jim Montgomery's uh, easily one of the uh, best that I've been around. And uh, for me, the biggest thing I learn from him every day is how to prepare, um, how to be on your toes, how to be expecting different things and to think outside the box, not necessarily always doing the same thing and um, he pushes me every day to try and think outside the box and to try and do things differently and I think that's um, on our staff it's kind of contagious and we're always looking for new ways to try and help our players give them tools to be successful uh, both on and off the ice. I have a question for Tavis over here. You guys had a great run a year ago making it to, uh, to the Frozen Four. Uh, how, how did last year's team and, and result, I know you guys were up here last year speaking about your, your loss to uh, North Dakota, but still having a real successful season. How did last year's team affect you guys over the summertime and even into the early part of this year to make your run this year? I think it served as, as instant motivation. I think the, the second we lost in Tampa, there was a large group of seniors that was motivated to come back and change that and it was right from the get-go I mean right from the time they stepped back on campus uh, from Tampa they were they were ready to go uh, whether it was the training in the off season or once the season started and we were on the ice uh, you could see it in their in their not only in their in their eyes and in their actions but in their voices I remember a very early uh, interview with Will Butcher I don't even know if Butcher was a captain yet they interviewed him and they said what is your guys is goals this upcoming year and he says it's our same goal we have every year just to win a national championship and he said it was such um, he said it so matter of factly that you just automatically believed and every player believed that we had a chance to do that and it was our goal and it was uh, it was a mindset early on Um, for us, uh, first half of the year, we, you know, it's one day a week. Um, and then in the second half, uh, probably once every two weeks, we go two days off a week. And it varies on a Monday or a Tuesday, depending on what our strength coach thinks is best for them physically. Uh, we usually uh, take one day at the beginning of the year, and then uh, many times Tuesdays in the second half of the year. If we uh, play uh, on the road on uh, Friday and Saturday, uh, sometimes Monday, you know, get a feeling of what, what, what's in the guys, you know. If they're a little tired, along, there's no sense that give them a day off. I, I, I'm a great believer in that. I mean, years ago, I used to give them Thursdays off. We went, went, went on the ice for about five minutes. There's a bit. Boom. If we had a long weekend series and the kids, uh, they played better because they had more energy. The, you can teach them all you want. If they don't have the juice, they're not going to perform. And so many of us, including myself, we overcoach, and our practices are sometimes too long. Um, one thing that Tavis actually does with our players is uh, he's constantly sending them videos, uh, text messages at night. He's watching NHL games. And um, I think just players these days, they like to see things happen on video uh, to try and replicate things, especially NHL players. So we try and implement a lot of NHL video 
um, in our early teaching uh, during the year, and then throughout the year, if things are getting stale, Monty will grab power play clips from NHL teams. I'll grab PK clips from NHL teams, and Tavis is constantly sending, you know, goal scoring, how guys have their hands positioned, how they're setting their feet, um, things like that. I think seeing the highest level players do it, that really intrigues our players and um, gives an opportunity to watch them at the highest level and grow. We, we just run highly competitive practices. I use the clock a lot. I keep score a lot. I just try to keep them on their toes and be as competitive as they can all week long in practice. And uh, we have a lot of fun with it. And I, I think that keeps them uh, motivated every day they come in and they're ready to go at each other. And um, I try to keep it as simple as I can as far as that goes. But uh, I think that helps them to be more creative and more. If they come to practice every day and they're fired up to get out in the ice, they're going to perform better and I, they're going to get better. Every day we post a practice plan. Probably when they get to the rink, it's already up. And then occasionally, like to do something different, we put a practice plan. The first two drills are player's choice, and just uh, especially in the second half. I don't post it. I probably should. I've been told to. Uh, would help a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> but um, I go in before practice, and I, I don't talk a lot. Uh, you know, I give five minutes, I go over all the drills, and the expectations of the drills, once we get on the ice, and I copied this a little bit from Sean years ago, uh, where you have three or four drills, then you take a lap, come over, get a little water. A lot of us probably uh, uh, do that now, and I still do it. And, um, and then maybe go to the whiteboard and go over a couple new drills, but I try not to... Um, talk too much on the ice. I, I think as a sports psychologist was saying there, um, they learn better by playing in the drills and, and less talking, and uh, we try to do that. Mike, what's the biggest difference to you from your first win to your second win? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, I was at St. Lawrence, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the first win at St. Lawrence was unbelievable because we were trying to turn the whole program around and get things going. And I had a, a, a lot of freshmen on the team, and we, we had a fabulous, fabulous year. Um, and, and, you know, this year, I got the same tickle this year. For some reason, I, I got energized. I think... I, I got really energized this year with the group I had. They did it to me. I was having fun with them, and I, I look forward to practice every day. And so I've been lucky. I got lucky. So both of them are good. Uh, we uh, used a guy, uh, John Yeager. Um, he came in and spent three days with us. He did a nice job with the guys off camp. It was right before we got on the ice. Oh, they had been skating, like captain's practice, but without the coaches. And he set up you know, some fun games and team building things, and the guys really liked it. And uh, then later on near the playoffs, He's from Indiana, so we had him on the TV there. That what do they call that when you script him? Skype. Skype. Huh? Skype. Skype. Skype him. Yeah. So they had it in the library. <laughs> we had a nice in the library. We had the big screen TV, and there he was. Now I stayed out of it. Uh, I let, I talked to him, but I let him have their own, and I and I thought that worked pretty good. Um, we don't use outside help. Um, there's a couple of different tools that we've used. Well, I have to, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, it, you know what? Um, picking brains of other coaches in our athletic department has really helped. Um, our soccer, men's soccer coach, Jamie Franks, is an unbelievable coach, and he uses this leadership guide that really holds players accountable where they are. On, and I think I talked about it last year. It's a commitment continuum. And it's unreal, that the, the awareness it creates uh, on your own teammates. And how we do it is each player individually comes and they're half in a meeting at right before Christmas, before they break. And we sit there as coaches and ask them where they think they are. And they tell us where they think they are and why. And then we tell them where, where we think they are and why. And then in that week we have off in early February, two weeks before we split them into four groups. Whereas no one that lives together is in the same group. So they have to get together at a library or uh, Dunkin' Donuts or whatever and they have to meet and they have to evaluate another group. So now, now it's accountability in an open forum and it's done really, we, I used to do a different thing in junior hockey and I did it at Maine with Sean Walsh, it was called the hot seat, but I found that was negative usually and some players couldn't handle it uh, because the player, it would be anonymous, this was not anonymous and guys would encourage guys to be more competitive in a real positive fashion or they would tell them we need to hear your voice more. We respect you more. It is really well. It's I think been a big part of why we've done so well in the second half. DC, I got a question for you here. You obviously, you lost a, a key part of your decor uh, and kind of a crucial part of uh, the the championship game. If you could speak a little bit to how you guys handled that as, as a staff, or was that something that because uh, obviously you rallied well from that. Um, or was it the group of guys that came together? If you could speak about that a little bit. Um, thankfully, we have Will Butcher. So he was on the ice a lot more. Um, getting down to five with 60 minutes left, the tough part was we used the TV timeout there, the 15-minute TV timeout at the 16, so we didn't get another one till under the 10. And um, really just Duluth are a hard matchup uh, for us and trying to make sure that we were spotting guys um, against certain lines and um, – getting our guys to have short shifts and the TV timeout came at the 10 and and then really from there we were down to four and um, I think the last three minutes Butcher and Plant didn't come off the ice uh, with the whistles that were happening and the timeouts called so fortunate to have great players that can execute in those situations. Was there any angst on on the bench obviously he's a key part of your team or was that something the guys just rallied behind? Yeah guys rallied behind I mean obviously Duluth had a huge push after he got hurt and um, I think certainly our decor, they were excited by the challenge, the four that played a lot down the stretch and um, certainly rallied behind us. A lot said what was on the bench was, um, let's do it for Tarek and, and things like that. So certainly a rallying point for our decor. We just, uh, we're open and honest about it. Um, I think I remember before the tournament started, I talked about um, eliminating all distractions and that you only have so many opportunities in your career to win championships and it's right in front of us. So please don't let advisors, parents, uncles, grandmothers come in the way. Well, the one that hurt was Trevor Moore because it was like on August 5th. Is that what you're talking about in the summer? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Trevor Moore one hurt because we we thought that we had a team to win. And losing him, now we're going to have to rely on some young forwards to produce at a high level. And thankfully they did. Um, but you know what? Um, I just talked to the captains that were coming back. And Will Butcher was uh, thought that – because I really didn't think Trevor should leave. Um, it was the first time, like, Dan Heinen, I thought, was the right time. But Trevor, I thought, was making a mistake. And I've told everybody that in our, in our family. And um, so I think uh, Will Butcher thought, I thought our hopes of winning a national championship were done. And I remember him trying to pump me up. And 
about it. And I was laughing that he, I was awesome that he was trying to pump me up about it, that, hey, we're going to be fine. And I remember replying to him, and I said, yeah, I'm not worried about us. I know we're going to be really good. I said, I'm worried about Trevor. And that's why I cared so much about Trevor's decision. Um, and I think we're, we just discuss it openly about how we're going to have to be different. And we challenged our decor that they had to carry us in the first half, and they did. Coach McShane, you talked a little bit about some of your practice habits. Obviously, your record this year was outstanding. You know, I think you lost one game all year. How were you able to maintain that consistency? Obviously, you had a great group of guys, but how were you able to stay with that? Was it something that was discussed after you guys went on long streaks, or, or how did you guys handle that? It was funny. We, uh, we kept most of the lines the same all year long. There was a consistency. And I, I learned a long time ago, I had a French kid uh, play with Vaughn. Where's Vaughn? Remember Benny? Well, he's a French kid, and uh, Benny, after practice, I said, any questions? He says, yeah, yeah coach, you know, uh, I hate to go fishing with you. And I said, what? He says, I hate to go fishing you with you. I says, why is that? And he says, you're always fucking up the lines. <laughs> <laughs> so... I <laughs> so I tried this year not to fuck up the lines. <laughs> I really did. I, I, you know, you get itchy as a coach saying, "How can we get better? Should I change this guy? Should I change?" And my assistants were good. They go, "Coach, we're all right right now. You know, wait till we lose at least lose a game or something." So uh, I think that helped a lot. Um, and our practice went very smooth and and hard fought and. You know, I got Cap Raider with me, and he watches our practices afterwards, and Cap is great. He jokes with the kids, and has a good sense of humor. And he does say, he said to me, we have very, very competitive practices, and it carries into the, uh, a game. So you go to your strength, and I, th I think that's what helped. I, I don't think it's necessarily specific. To, I think it's a mentality that having coached at Denver with these guys for a couple of years that our team has. They treat every game differently. They constantly are um, in the moment. They're never ahead of themselves. They're never behind. They're always that next shift, that nef next game. So it's a mentality that literally goes into every single game we play, whether it's a weekend of the same opponent twice or in the NCAA tournament where it's two separate teams. They're constantly in the moment, so they never get ahead of themselves. And once that uh, mentality is created, it takes the life off its own on a little bit, and guys are constantly there. I think we have a pretty good culture, and it's been perpetual. We've had great leaders f for years, and um, it's expected in our community. Uh, we're, we're like Maine and some of the rural areas uh, with a big dog there. You know, for a Division Three program, we uh, we have all the fa uh, fans and the, the people in our community support the team. The faculty members are all at the games. They know the kids. You know, it's great if you do everything right. You know, you get a big pat in the back, but one thing goes wrong and everybody knows about it. So I think the expectations are set right away. Not, our, our type of school is not for everyone. It's a military school. We take a lot of civilians and so forth like that. But we tell guys when we recruit them right away, hey, no nonsense. You're up here to play, and this is the expectations. You, you've got to do a lot of community service, and you got to keep your grades up. And uh, we, you know, we have like five or six engineering majors on our team, and a couple of pre-med, and uh, I, so it's it's easy for me to be honest with you. If you have that type of kid there, there's less usually less situations that can occur, and you get better leadership. I, I wouldn't say there's guys that, like, I don't think I would have thought Will Butcher would be our captain when he was a sophomore. So, 
Um, I think they just continue to evolve. They're, they're young kids when they come into you, and you don't know how they're going to mature and how they're going to become people that you want to lead your culture. So I think it evolves over time. want to make me cry again or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, they're incredible. And look, with Sean Walsh, he was, I mean, Red can speak to it. He just pushed everybody, he continually pushed you. Um, and not nicely a lot of times, right, Red? <laughs> um, and that's the thing that was great about him. He was always trying. I remember the one time where I knew, because it was my, I was the captain, so he did a lot of communication with me. And he had just told our one f freshman goaltender that he was going to be redshirted. And this was like November. And we went out for practice, and uh, Sean had long practices, way too long. Um, and we did the first half, and we come in flood, and we're going out for the second hour and a half of practice. And uh, he says, uh, you know what was amazing out there? And he goes, uh, you know, I just gave bad news to Blair Marsh. And I told him he's going to be redshirted. And he goes, and you know what? He was the hardest working guy in practice today. And he was a sieve. I mean, he was awful in practice that day. But that was Sean's way of lifting someone up after. And he just continually was thinking about how to push the group, whether it was individually to help the group collectively. And that's the one thing I really took from Sean. He was never off. He was always preparing. Um, and with Grant, I mean, it's just the one story I, I think that, really crystallizes Grant is not a hockey story. When he was working with me in Dubuque, we had a young man that helped out at the rink, and the guy was didn't have a lot of money, and he was just around, and we would give him odd jobs to be able to give him some money because he had a young uh, family. And we thought we were being really nice doing that for him and taking him to lunch a couple of times a week. And we sent him as a job to go get Grant in Madison. And so in that hour and a half ride, Grant had this young man, didn't graduate from high school, signed up at a vocational school because he figured out he has computer skills and he was going to get, and the kid graduated with a software, um, I don't know what it would be, an associate's degree. But that's what Grant did. He connected with people. And it didn't matter who. I mean, the stories of him recruiting and playing pool with Jean Isroy's mother and letting her win so he'd get the recruit. I mean, that's just stuff that Grant did, and that's why he's a special man. to listen more than you talk. I have one for, oh. He's got sorry. Yeah, I, have, okay. I actually have a grand story. And it was, I was probably, it was probably 90, I might have been in the business for a couple years, 97 maybe. And uh, I was going to see a kid up in Bonneville. And I was like, I'm going up to Bonneville because I know nobody else will go up there to see this kid. And I walked into the rink, and I was so stressed that someone else was going to be in the rink. And uh, I'm looking around, nobody's there. And I'm like, yes. It's a period in, period and a half in, and I'm the only one there. The kid's playing great. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, and uh, I look beside me, and Grant's right beside me. And I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. Great. Grant's going to talk to the kid. I'll never, I'll never get a word in. I'll never talk to him. And uh, so I finally asked him, I said, uh, Grant, where are all the players this year? Where are they? And he goes, uh, he might have said kid or some reference, something like that. He goes, there's players everywhere. You just got to look. And then he walked away. And it stuck with me forever. Question here for the Denver assistants. You guys talked a lot, and Jimmy even referenced this in his speech last night about the spelling of process. Um, I'll let you handle that one, DC, uh, how you actually spell process. But if you could speak to how, it, and it sounds like your team really took on that identity of following the process. Uh, if you guys could kind of enlighten us a little bit on that. Yeah. Um, so it's my, my DU education coming out. Uh, Monty, we were in the Frozen Four, or no, it was the uh, region last year in St. Paul. And our players, they always write the process on the board. It's on our home dressing room. Uh, whiteboard and it's seven things we try and do in the game that give us success and um, so the players always write it when we go on the road and 
after Monty's meeting, he accidentally erased the word. And uh, the players were going out for their stretch, so I figured I'd, I'd take a little initiative. And uh, I grabbed the marker and I wrote it back on there. And I wrote it with the C and the S in the middle. And I looked at it and I thought, I said, I'm pretty sure that's how you spell it. <laughs> didn't, didn't bother checking for confirmation. And uh, went back into the coach's room and like nothing happened. The players come in, they're like, who the hell spelt that? <laughs> and, uh, and it's just kind of stuck uh, since then. And uh, it took on a bigger meaning this year. It's kind of cool. Our, our players, they always create playoff shirts. And uh, Will Butcher and the captains, they came up with our playoff shirt was going to have the process on the back with the arrows, but they're going to spell it our way. And and they even told our equipment guy, hey, when you send this in, make sure that this is how it's spelled. Like, we want it spelled wrong. And um, and Will's reasoning behind it, what they came up with, a deeper meaning, is our seven things that we try and hit. I don't know if we've ever hit all seven. And so it's an imperfect thing, but it's our team always striving for perfection. And the fact that the word was misspelled kind of signified that, that we'd never really gotten it fully right, but we're always close. And as long as we were close and we were striving for that, um, that we'd be pretty well off as a group. I, I, one thing to add here, we had a um, sign made at the beginning of the year. We're trying to th think of a theme, you know. And we didn't have a great season the year before. Uh, we didn't make the nationals and so forth. And the kids were a little resentful that they hadn't won a national championship like some of the other teams. And so I think there was with inside the team, there was this, not resentfulness, but eagerness to do something a little better. So we finally came up with a uh, slogan, leave nothing behind. So I had this sign made up before we go on the ice and the signs up there and the kids would hit it and that was it. And before we got on the bus to Utica, I says, take that sign down. So we, that thing was glued on with uh, Gorilla Glue. And we, <laughs> I mean, maintenance guy. I said, "Don't break the son of a bitch." I want to. <laughs> so we're screwing around. We get, we finally get the sign on. We throw it in the bus, and we go to Utica, and we got the locker rooms on the corner. And I said, "Put it up there," and they put it, but they're having trouble, you know, the managers with the tape because it was buckling a little bit. But they got it up. They got the goddamn thing up, and the kids would hit it. And so anyway, we're playing in a championship game, and we come in after the second period, and the sign fell down. You know, the stickers. And I, and I said that, Marsh, I, I said to uh, Stevie Matz, I says, hey, get those goddamn kids. You got four managers on the trip. They can put that freaking thing up before we come out again. It's a bad omen. A goddamn sign goes down, right? <laughs> Forget giving them a speech. Get the sign up. So they finally got the goddamn sign up again. The kids go by top, and we got lucky we win the game. So I get back a couple of days later, and I said, Jesus, what, what, what did we do with the sign? And he said, Coach, we left it behind. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't need it anymore. Coach Miss Jane, you talked a lot about, you read a lot of books over the summertime. It sounds like you, you made some significant changes, how you went about uh, handling your team this year from spending time in the locker room. Um, did you talk a lot about the change that was coming, was, or was that something that, meaning with your staff, or was that something that evolved throughout uh, the year? Because obviously with 700 wins, you've been extremely successful. and start to change it, your ways a little bit uh, must have been somewhat difficult. You know, I joined Gordon, you had up here last, was it last year you had him up? Mm -hmm. And I got all his books, and they're a simple read. I mean, and uh, so I read all those books. And the Ohio State coach, what's uh, the football coach at Ohio State? Woody. Uh, his book is fantastic. That was one of the best books, and I, I forget the title. But uh, that's, that's a great book on the championship season they had a couple of years ago. And there was a couple of other ones. But the, the Gordon ones and that, it just got me propelled to, you know, it brainwashes you what it does. You know, if you read enough of that stuff, it, it does sink in a little bit. And uh, it was more, at e it was something at ease. It was something just be a little easier. And, and my goal this year was to have a good time this year. I really was. I, I said to my wife, I said to Banker last night, 
no matter what, I want to have a good time with these kids. They're great kids. I got 10 seniors. So I think the readings did help. I would suggest that to any of the young coaches to do a lot of readings. Send out a reading list to your team. I do it. Kids today don't read, though. They don't know history. They don't read that much. Um, but they know those computers, that's for sure. Uh, but um, anyway, that's what we did. They didn't change. Huh? The players haven't changed. The players haven't changed. No, as far as kids go. <laughs> it's personalities. <laughs> Getting close to wrapping up here. If there's any other questions. Yeah, our guys, our guys come in for a, a six-week summer school period where they come in, the incoming freshmen, the ones that are, uh, have the time to do it. Um, then the rest of the guys, we don't get out until returning, get out in early June, and they usually go home for a while, and then come back uh, in July, and then back home in August, and then come back in the fall. It's a pretty structured uh, um summer that works pretty well they get a, a good rest and a good break from from denver and from school or away from us and come back and get quality training in as well works pretty well actually our kids are throwing out the first pitch tonight the yankees red sox game and i'm down here and after that bye bye <laughs> Um, we'll start usually on Tuesday, um, and I guess early in the year there's more teaching of us. Um, as we go on throughout the year, uh, definitely we start our pre-scout stuff on Tuesday. We'll, we'll do our penalty kill and how we're going to break the puck out on Tuesday. Um, and then as the week goes on, Wednesday will be more power play. Um, and then, and then Thursday's our five on five meeting. So each day there's maybe, um, anywhere from 15 to 25 clips. And uh, it, it gets in kind of ingrained, I guess, as a part of our routine. And we try and stick with it as the year goes on so that the guys are, are uh, they're comfortable with it, they're familiar with it. And then, like we said, as, or, uh, we'll, we'll throw in some NHL stuff as the year goes on. We'll use that early. Um, there's times where we'll have a couple of the power play guys come in and we'll actually watch the pre-scout stuff with us as coaches and get their thoughts on what they're seeing, try and mix it up that way. Uh, with the power play or the penalty kill, but that's a little bit of our video. Monday, we I have a good video kid now, and uh, Monday we do all positive things that from the weekend before. So we take all of, you know, whether it's a four check, whether it's a great goal, a great save, and we play that for about eight minutes at least in, before our practice starts uh, on Monday to start the week out. And then Thursday we just do tendencies of the Opposing team face-offs, uh, four-check, all that stuff. Well, great. I'd like to thank you guys for taking some time here today and uh, sharing with us. If you guys want to head upstairs, we have those uh, breakout sessions you'll be able to attend to. Uh, they're 20 minutes apiece.
Oscar, go ahead and grab a seat. You were trying uh, to figure out a way on how to get Ross to be up on like a uh, one of those phone systems and have <laughs> fly out there. Oh, gosh, that was hilarious. <laughs> There's a uh, portable mic here and then the one right there. Were you on that side? They go this side? All right, if you could uh, take your seats here, we'll get started, please. So welcome to the uh, championships panel. Unfortunately, Plattsburgh uh, was unable to be with us here today. Um, but we do have uh, uh, Matt and, and Tony from Clarkson. And then we've uh, also invited the uh, U.S. gold uh, medal uh, U18 staff as well with, uh, with Joel and Lash and, and Courtney. So um, I'm going to start by just asking a couple questions of, uh, of our panel here. And then uh, we will be looking to open it up. Uh, to uh, to our body here to uh, ask any questions that you might have of any of the coaches up here. So this is always one of the uh, the highlights here to be able to uh, pick the brains of some pretty darn good coaches. So please uh, feel free to do that. But Matt, with uh, with you and Tony and, and Britt's not here, but why don't you just kind of give a little recap of the season? Um, you know, in regards to the makeup of your team, uh, seniors down to freshmen, were you a younger team, uh, uh, an older team, more veteran team, those types of things that, that kind of helped you along the way? Yeah, I, th I think this year we're actually a little bit spread out, to be honest with you. I think 2014 we were, we were an older team, and I think that really helped us. Um, going into this season, we were a little bit more spread out. So we had to bring along some, some younger kids in that and get them on board. Um, with regards to the season, actually, we, we started out like crap, to be honest with you. We started the season 2-3-1, and one, um, but our, you know, a big period for us was uh, we had an early series against Wisconsin, um, and we weren't playing very good hockey, I'd say, at that time. Um, but we had a good weekend against Wisconsin. We actually had losing both those games. We lost in overtime the first game, and then the, the second game, uh, I think it was 1-1 with about six minutes left, and then we ended up losing that one. But um, that really forced us to kind of figure things out pretty quick. Um, so I, I think that series really helped us out. Uh, from that point on, the next 35 games, we lost one game the entire season. Um, so I thought that really kind of allowed us to kind of figure some things out, allowed our older kids to really um, help those young kids understand what it was going to take to kind of be at that level. Tony, what was the experience like for you, uh, you know, first year with the program, um, you know, and to, to be heading to the Frozen Four and, and getting an opportunity to hoist that, uh, that uh, championship trophy? What was that experience like for you? And, um, you know, in particular, coming down the stretch uh, in the playoffs, um, what was your role and uh, or what did you feel was your most important role um, in that playoff series? Well, <clears throat> to start, I mean, it was a pretty decent first year. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Can only uh, go down from there. Yeah, <laughs> I'd start there. But, uh, no, it, coming in the fr at the beginning, it was just, uh, you know, creating relationships. I've known Matt for 16 years now. Um, known Britt for a little bit, just be being on the road and also being a SLU alum. So, uh, you know, it was just kind of, Cultivating those relationships at the beginning um, and then getting into the actual team, you know, I'd say down the down the stretch, we all take on different roles, different days. Some of us bring energy one day when somebody else isn't feeling the greatest. So, um, you know, it's just kind of that's what my role was down the stretch was bring energy and make sure everybody's pushing the same direction. Yeah, awesome. Matt, for for you, uh, you know, second national championship uh, here in in a few years. Um, how did the experience? I, I believe your seniors were freshmen in uh, fourteen, correct? Yes. Uh, and, and how did that? Uh, uh, were you guys able to? Uh, were the other players able to lean on on your seniors quite a bit, and your seniors able to really share some wisdom there uh, in the Frozen Four? Yeah, I definitely think um, they helped quite a bit. Um, a lot of it was probably just putting the, the rest of the team at ease a little bit. Um, you know, just having them realize, just going into that uh, Frozen Four confident, um, just letting them know about what their experience was the first time around and, and just how great of an experience it was and just how to handle the whole entire experience of the Frozen Four, obviously. 
uh, you've been there, so it, it's a little bit different than your normal routine in that with the banquets and everything going on. So just those little things uh, that our older kids were able to kind of portray to the, the younger kids in that uh, to make sure that they had fun at those events and that. But then when we were at the rink, it was all business because we were there to kind of do a job. So, Cool. Uh, JJ, you, uh, you know, third year with the, the U18 team, uh, third year winning uh, gold, um, you know, how is it, uh, how is preparing for a two-week tournament different than, you know, being a, a coach at a, at a full, uh, uh, of, of a college team where you, where you have to worry about the full season? I think the, uh, the difference for us as a staff is trying to realize the fact that you can't change a kid in two weeks, even though you really want to, and so it goes into the selection process and the hours that are spent, uh, as a group, just talking about different players and what what kind of you know pieces of the puzzle you want to have. Uh, as a college coach, you have a little bit more time and a lengthy season to to try to prepare. But uh, for a two-week tournament, uh, everything is different. And to be honest, uh, you know sometimes uh, the the unlikely heroes re you know uh, present themselves at the right time, and other times it's the kids you you, you counted on. Uh, but you never, you're never quite sure until you get there. And so we, uh, we just had a, a good group again. I go back and, and look at the track record of, of the last several years uh, of the kind of the foundation of, of players and development that we've had. And, and I think that uh, goes um, a long way in our, our recent uh, success of, uh, of making it to the gold medal game each year. What do you kind of feel are the most important things that, that you as the head coach and as a staff have to focus on with? with your players in that two weeks, either on the ice or, or off the ice? Well, I think the the, the first thing is you, you hope you pick the right ones, but you're always pretty sure that you made a, a mistake or two when you get there. Uh, mistake not meaning the, the player's bad, but you realize you were, you were maybe not quite as accurate um, about certain players as you might have hoped, and that just goes to the, the difference between selecting a team based on a you know week or two that you've seen them um, I think as we as we got into the tournament, I um, I think the the success that we had was was trying to create chemistry um, and identify roles and responsibilities. The worst part of the tournament for me is the day the parents arrive um, because we actually have had to talk to our kids. All right, parents are coming today. Here's what you're going to tell your grandpa and your mom or your dad or whatever because they're pretty good right up until their parents arrive and then all of a sudden, you know, dad's asking why aren't you on the power play and you've always been on the power play and now you're not on this line or that line. So I think that uh, that culture piece of trying to, to preserve the integrity of a group playing for a common goal is, is the most important part of winning uh, at any level, but certainly in a two-week tournament, it's the part of uh, getting it to to where you want to be. And so I think that uh, that role identification in a two-week tournament is probably the most important. Joel talked about the role identification, uh, Court and, and Lash, for for both of you. Um, what were your roles with the team? And and you know, as you get to the the uh, championship game, you've kind of got the weight of a country on you a little bit. And um, you know, how do you uh, how do you coach to, to keep the kids at ease and not too uptight and too scared as they're going into a big moment? Um, I think I think just in general, the entire the entire group that that's been there the last couple of years, um, right down from the trainers and everybody that's there is just a really uh, good group, willing to take care of. You know, you got 15 year olds on the team, um, and so that's always a different dynamic coaching them, and um, they're a lot of fun. Uh, just different different jokes, different personalities, things like that. Um, so I think, you know, our job was kind of just to make sure we're, we're guiding them as best we can, but making sure they're staying relaxed. I mean, they were doing homework, you know, they're stressing about their math. And I mean, we had 15 year old asking for help with her math homework two years ago. Um, none of us could help her, but, um, I thought that was Courtney's, <laughs> Courtney's <laughs> strong suit. <laughs> uh, um, so, so that it's different. I mean, they're missing school and they're missing their families and, um, you know, to, to the last, well, this year we were away, but the last few years we weren't as far, so they had probably more family members around, and, and so we're just trying to keep them, um, you know, keep them relaxed and, and keep them having fun. How about for you, Court? Um, 
I just feel like they were they're a, it's a different group because they they um like music they listen to like fight song and stuff like that and they get all like hyped up and psyched up in the in the locker room and it's a different group where I'm like are they focused are they ready and they're just you know little kids dancing around and I think that's when it hits you that it's like a it's a two week experience that they'll never forget and obviously you want to get the gold in the end but there's so much that goes into it and the, and what I think is really interesting is, is watching how Joel keeps them together and, and the team chemistry piece and how important that was, um, I think, into, into getting there. Lash and I just try to keep them, you know, smiling, <coughs> crack some jokes here and there, and um, it's a pretty good ride. And Zlin's very nice that time of year. It's not cool at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and open it up. Uh, any questions from, from the group? game adjustments Matt you want that yeah I definitely think you're you're focused on what you're doing you're focused on what the other team's doing a little bit um, I think yeah once you get to the kind of that um, stage I guess the frozen four and that you got to rely on on your strengths and what you bring to the table and what your team does well in that but you also have to be prepared to make subtle adjustments that aren't going to throw your kids off that much easier either um, you know, you want to make it as difficult as possible on the other team, so those adjustments have to be made. But at the same time, you don't want to make so many adjustments or adjustments that are going to throw your team off as well. So there's a little bit of a balance there. Um, at least that's what I've found. I think for us, uh, it's, it's that answer times five. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, with the U18 group, uh, we're very fortunate to have great um, scouting department, and et cetera, when you're in a two-week tournament where you can see the opponent play uh, numerous times and you've got video. But the real challenge is to not over-prepare your team, in particular with the youth of the group that, that we have. Um, if you, if you over-prepare them, they're not ready for it. And so it's that fine line of, of kind of coaching them up within the game, but also perhaps reminding them that what they do best is, is, uh, is all we can really do well. And, and so when we remind our players of that in the midst of the game, it, it kind of calms them regardless of the opponent. Could be more than one thing. <laughs> one, one thing's pretty tough. Um, you know, I think, I think from our standpoint throughout their four years, you just want them to enjoy the ride. You want them to have uh, a great experience. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Uh, it's their teammates, it's team chemistry. Uh, winning's a part of that. Um, the, the, the academic side's a part of that. So there's a lot of things that go into it that we as coaches need to kind of manage on a day-to-day -day basis, to be honest with you. It's not just, uh, you know, whenever it comes up or anything it's day to day that and I'm sure the other coaches in this room understand that and realize that there's different things that pop up every single day that you need to deal with on a day to day basis to kind of help your your kids be in the right frame of mind the right situation to just be at their best on and off the ice so it's difficult to kind of pinpoint one thing but uh, for me it's always been make sure that they enjoy their experience and leave their, um, you know, having made lifelong friends and, and uh, just enjoying their time at Clarkson or wherever they may be. Uh, yeah, I'd say same for us is just making sure they're enjoying it. And I know kind of paraphrase Joel here a little bit, but um, he kind of always talks to them about, you know, we're as a group, they're going to probably be judged by, by the color. If I mess this up, let me know. Um, by the color that we win, but we wanted to make sure that um, as a group, that that's not what they were judging themselves by. Um, so that was kind of, did I get that right? <laughs> that's kind of what we talked to them about quite a bit. Color of the metal you're talking about, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Got it. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Mac? Hey guys, uh, how do you guys pick fast from the year? Like your team? Ha, ha, ha.
Uh, you know, ours is pretty obvious this year. We had a, a, a three-time um, member of our team who was an obvious leader in and out of the room. Um, Kayla Barnes, is that Kayla right? Barnes. So she she made the team as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, and and then by, I think, two days um, in January there, um, thank goodness she was born a little later. Um, but that, that was obvious for us. And we, uh, for the U18 side of things, we get a chance to see these kids in various components throughout the year, a couple of summer opportunities, and um, and then in August, I guess that's still summer. But, you know, there's so many environments that we get to to see them engage in that, that it's, uh, it kind of, it becomes obvious based on age and experience and maturity. Um, the, the other, you know, the alternate captains are kind of different. You try to not pick kids from the same area. You try to pick kids that are from different life experiences uh, because at that U18 level, again, coming into a short, uh, short tournament, you want to have people that can um, connect with, with a lot of different groups. But, um, but for us, it was pretty easy this year. Um, and, and that's a mostly attributed to how, how great of a person Kayla Barnes was. Um, and then the, the alternates were, were kind of easy to pick as well, just based on experience and things. So, um, I think figuring out who your leaders are each and every year is probably one of the more difficult things that you have to do as a coach. And I see a couple of people shaking their head out there. Um, some years it's it's straightforward. It's pretty easy. You might have someone that uh, you know they just have those leadership qualities that you're looking for. Um, to me, those are few and far between. Um, so I think it takes a lot of time to really figure out and weed out who those leaders are. And I say that because I think what we as coaches feel our good leadership qualities and good leadership skills don't necessarily translate to what the players think are good leadership and quality skills. And again, I see a lot of coaches shaking their heads out there. Um, to me, a leader is not just someone that is nice to everyone or something like that. You know, where, you know, kids on their team, they think, oh, she's a great leader because she goes out of her way to be nice. Yeah, that's one good quality, but they have to have these good qualities. So I think for us as coaches, it's really trying to figure out exactly what we feel are the qualities that we're looking for in a leader and then discussing those amongst the team and who has those qualities and getting them to understand that's our expectation, that's what we're looking for. If you're willing to adhere to that, be that, you can be a leader on our team. If you're not willing to do that, adhere to that, whatever it may be, maybe you're not a leader for our team. So each year I think it's different. Um, like I said, I think some kids really emerge and they're, and they're obvious choices. Um, and then I think sometimes there's, I think it's good to kind of discuss things amongst the players in that because um, as coaches, we don't see a lot of the things that go on. We're not in the locker rooms, we're not behind the scenes. Um, so I think having those discussion with your players um, to really figure out, you know, who you know, are good in those types of situations. Who's good behind the scenes in that? Because that's where a lot of it comes into play, too. Who's, who's on the same page and who's pulling in the same direction when the coaches aren't around. Um, so I think it's good to have conversations and, and try and figure things out in that sense. So do you ultimately, Matt, pick your captains? Do you get feedback from the kids? Do they vote with you having the ultimate authority? What? Uh, it's a little bit of everything, to be honest with you. The way we've always done it, you know, at the end of the season when we have our exit meetings, we, we talk to our players about leadership. And this year we had our players bring in, um, you know, something written down that we wanted to know what they thought good leadership qualities were, um, what some poor qualities were, um, just to get them thinking about those things. Um, for us, I think it's all about making sure that every single player in that locker room feels like they have uh, some kind of – they can bring some kind of leadership to the table. They don't just have to have a letter on their jersey, right? Um, it doesn't take a letter on your jersey to go up and if someone's having a bad day to go pick them up and say, hey, you know, let's have a good day today or let's go have a cup of coffee and let's talk about things or something like that. I, I want everyone to feel comfortable – uh, being able to 
notice those situations. So I think it was important for us to kind of sit down and, and get our players to really kind of think about those things and what good leadership qualities are so everyone can kind of do those things. So I think it's a lot of conversation amongst our players. We ask them who they see uh, amongst our their teammates having good leadership qualities and that. And usually pretty much most times it's in line with what the coaches think and that. But you, you get a lot of good feedback in that from your players. We'll both tackle it here. Um, I think over the years I've kind of tried a little bit of everything. I think it's it's situational. Um, it, it, sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. I, I don't think there's one particular way, you know, one captain, two assistants. I don't know if that's the perfect way. I don't know if co-captains. We had co-captains this year um, and two assistants. And it was great, and it also had its flaws, too. Um, so I don't know if there's one perfect situation. Like I said, I think it's kind of situational to your team and, and who the leaders are amongst those players and that and where everyone sees them. There's a lot of team dynamic that goes into it. There's a lot of thought process that goes into it. And, and like I said, sometimes uh, what you're getting from the players and that is in line with what you're thinking and, and you can go with it, and it may not be the best situation. And those are things that you're just going to have to weed out and, and deal with throughout the season. So um, for me, there's no right or wrong. There's no perfect kind of answer to that. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is uh, no matter what your captains are, whether it's two, one, as long as you're communicating with them every day and it's a constant thing throughout the entire year, you're going to be able to fix issues and you're going to be able to, you know, grab things early and kind of push through hard times per se. Um, so having two captains this year, obviously sometimes that can be two different train of thoughts, but it's getting them all on the, the same page. That's, a, that's the biggest thing with everything. I'll just add and then pass it on. The only thing I would add to that is um, if you're only going to have, if you have two, two players wearing a C or three or four, whatever, um, it's, 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 I, I don't have a problem with that. If you only have one player wearing the C, you better pick the right player, is how I feel. Because it's a lot harder to be the only player wearing a C on your jersey than it is to have support. Because even if you treat them the same, they're different because they have a different letter. And so you better pick the right kid. And, um, and as a coach, I've been right with that kid and sometimes not not so much, and uh, and it makes a huge difference if the right kids were in the sea. I mean, I would only add it just depends on, like the like, every year it's going to be different. So whatever group you have, you you kind of know what you need to add. If you need if you need two C's or you need to have more A's or who they are and its personality and a lot is the team chemistry and making sure that the last thing I want is like one kid to go this way, make a click with like three others and like pull away from the team. So I'm just very aware of trying to have the, you know, the, the pulse of the team and the right players there to, so everyone feels like they have somebody they can go talk to and they're all like well represented almost. So I think it's very different depending on, you know, which in the U18s, it's like every year it's gonna be different and then obviously college wise too, depending on your chemical makeup of the, of the group. Bethany just uh, is finishing her counseling master's program, so <laughs> that's a heck of a question <laughs> for this group. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I feel like probably, this is probably my, uh, I think, 17th year um, coaching, so I feel like I've had a decent amount of defining moments, and I think a lot of that is 
Uh, sometimes it's when you're out of place and you're working with a coach, and it, a lot of times it might be when you leave and just just kind of reflecting back um, on where you were or what you've been doing, uh, I think is always a good thing just to see, check in with yourself every couple years just to make sure, um, or, or just to kind of see what you've taken from, from other places. And, and I think that kind of helps mold what your coach's philosophy um, is going to be. So I would say that is just kind of reflecting back. Um, you know, so I think every time I've gone to a new school, um, just really appreciating what I had there and, and who, who I was working with um, in, in every area um, and just kind of making sure you always do that. I'd like to hear from others too. That was, <laughs> that's good. Uh, there's a lot of things. Um, you know, one that really sticks out for me is I think it was two or three years ago we were on a road trip and uh, one of our one of our kids' uh, parents got in an accident and passed away. And it was really difficult to figure out how to manage that situation for me, being put in that situation, because I not only had to figure out how to deal with it with her, but the assistant coaches, the team. Uh, it's something that you can't be prepared for. And... Um, it was just a really tough time. And just to see how the team rallied around everything really sticks out in my mind. Uh, but like I said, it, it's a really difficult situation on how to figure out what to do. You just have to go with your instinct. You have to do, obviously, what's best for the player, the family. Um, yeah, it was just a really difficult time. Sorry to bring the mood down there. I wouldn't say there's been one defining moment. I think it's, for us as coaches, it's a, it's an everyday thing. So I always look at it as you're constantly learning, whether it's, you know, something from the head coach, assistant coach, the players, something they're doing during the course of a practice or games. You know, it's just an ongoing learning curve. You know, as somebody who's young to the sport as a coach, be a sponge as much as you can. Take it all in. And then you can filter out things from there. I was just going to um, – I got an email once from a player after she was, like, gone, you know, four years out or something. And it's just when they reach out to you and then just say thank you, and it wasn't about because, like, I taught her how to pivot or, like, skate faster. Not that I can teach that anyways, but the whole point is that they, it's not about the game. It's not even about the hockey. So like from coaching, I enjoy it because you can have such an impact on these kids' lives and it's not just about the hockey. It's about like their four years. Like I had a blast in college and I think that every kid should have an awesome four years, six years, whatever it has to be for the individual. But um, I think that for me is when I, when I saw that, it wasn't about like X's and O's. There's so much more going on um, than that. And I think that maybe I like, I like my job because because you can, you can make an impact, and that's pretty cool. I guess I'll just uh, finish with when real life intersects hockey or hockey intersects real life, I think those are all the pivotal moments that we experience as coaches. Um, because at the end of the day, as competitive as we all are, I think you last a longer time in this game when you care about the players. And so when those moments come up, you know, as Matt described or Courtney described, whatever, when you reflect on them, I think uh, when real life intersects hockey and you get a chance to actually have a real conversation with a kid that started because they are on your team but ends because you care about them, um, those are the moments that you take with you forever. It's a lot easier for this half of the table than that half of the table because we got a short window of time and a common goal of uh, that's that's you know realistic and attainable, but not certainly not favorable or, or and and not guaranteed. So it's a lot easier. I mentioned it earlier in, in joking, but 
for us to, to try to get a kid to buy into a certain role is a lot easier for two weeks because we can say this is what we need you to do and, um, and, and, and they're usually willing to buy in. Uh, and if they're not, then we've made a, a mistake in the selection process. But for the U18 side, it's, it's generally a little easier because it's a shorter period of time and most of those kids, uh, if we've selected them correctly uh, uh, for any international opportunity from, from any organization, they're willing to do anything for the, for the jersey and for the opportunity to, to hear their anthem, whether that's you know US or Canada or any place else. And so I think it's easier for us to, to get them to, to buy in for a little bit. It's not always guaranteed, um, but, but it's a little easier. It's, I'll, I'll let uh, these guys answer the harder one. Um, I just think it's a lot of communication, constant communication, and, and just really getting your entire team buying into the fact that every single role on the team is important to the, the results. Um, uh, we're not, as a program, we're not very result focused. We're, we're more day to day process kind of focused than that. So just getting those kids to believe that what they're putting into it day to day is not only helping themselves but helping the entire team. Um, I think trying to get that point across. Uh, I think there's something out there what you spend 80% of your time with your bottom 20 or something like that. And I, yeah, I definitely think that holds true sometimes. Uh, whether you like it or not, you still have to communicate with every single player in your team. Some kids you got to put more time into than others. Um, some you got to coddle more than others. It's really just kind of figuring out what is going to motivate that particular kid, but then also within your team kind of dynamics and system as well. Um, we have a strength coach that works with our program, obviously. Um, he's with us every day. Um, I put a lot on him, to be honest with you. He, we have constant communication with him. Uh, our training sessions during the season are Monday, Wednesday. Uh, we have some recovery stuff within that, too, on the other days. Um, we monitor our practices and everything as well. Um, we're really big on the recovery side of things. Um, he's got a good grasp on on that kind of stuff. He does different tests and stuff throughout the year to see if we're overtraining the athletes or not. Um, if he comes in and tells me, hey, you know, we're dragging a little bit in that, we need a day off, I give him a day off. I don't question him, anything like that. That's his domain. Um, I put full faith and trust in, in what he tells me to do. He'll come in and say, yeah, we're going good right now. You can get after him a little bit. Uh, he'll come in and tell me, hey, we need to keep it a little bit shorter and that. You can go high intensity, but keep it a little bit shorter. Um, so we're in constant communication with our, our strength coach. So I, I put a lot of value in, in that. There's no question about it. I think he's done a phenomenal job for us. Um, what was the second part of your question there? Sorry. I, I definitely think it's a big part of it. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of pieces. You know, I'm sure Frosty will, will say the same too. Like when you when you get to the Frozen Four and when you're fortunate enough to win a national championship, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, a lot of things have to go right. You got to get lucky a little bit, in some senses. Um, but there's definitely, you know, a lot of different pieces that have to be in place, and, and definitely the strength and the conditioning side of things is is uh, most certainly one of those. Yeah, we've got we had some values that we we kind of preach again. It's harder for a, a short term tournament, but we we preach some values and certain expectations because we wanted to, as uh, as Katie said earlier, we wanted to say to our players, we're going to measure our 
our individual success based on these values and we're gonna be measured um, as a group by our success on the ice. So I think we, um, isn't that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was right on. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there's definitely components of that. Uh, those are all different based on what you think your team needs. Um, I think the hard part about values and culture is to make it real and to try to say, instead of trying to pick you know, buzzwords and read the New York Times best-selling leadership book um, and, and put it into your program, to actually pick things that are actually valuable, measurable, and attainable by your players. And that if you're, if you're gonna pick a, a set of values or a, a way to, to process how you define success, make sure that you bring it up every day if possible. Um, here's why we want to be tough today. Here's an example of being tough. Here's an example of being grateful. Um, this is what it means to be devoted to, to your teammates. And sometimes that's on the ice, sometimes it's in the training room, sometimes it's in the strength conditioning area, sometimes it's on the airplane, sometimes it's in the classroom, uh, so on and so forth. So, so yeah, it's definitely a, a big part of, of our group the last few years, but more important, for us was to try to take players who are only trying to make a team and try to make it about more than that. And that was specific to our U18 group to say, let's take the focus on just trying to make this team and actually turn the focus onto some value so that then we can accomplish perhaps uh, winning at the highest level. Because uh, if kids are only trying to make the team or make the first line or make the second line or whatever, uh, they lose sight of the, the, the big picture. Yeah, for us, it's just a, obviously a longer process. Um, you know, we preach to making sure everybody's staying in, in the moment every day. You know, it's what are you doing that day? And then if it's a good day, how do you go from there? And if it's a bad day, how do you fix it? You know, so you're, you're constantly moving forward. Quite a bit. <laughs> um, I, I think you have to. I think you have to have your leaders and your team feel um, like they have some added value um, to the decision-making process and stuff like that. Obviously, the inmates aren't running the asylum and stuff, but um, I think as coaches, we've kind of figured out a way on how to get them to realize um, the things that we want them to do or say but have them make it feel like it came from them. Uh, I think that's kind of a, a way that we as coaches kind of manage certain things. Um, but it, 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 not all the time. I shouldn't say that. Uh, you know, most time you give them some input and stuff, and, and they have some really good insight. Um, and most of the time it's right in line with exactly what you're looking to do anyways, right? Because, again, we talk about making sure that everyone's on the same page and pulling in the same direction. We talk a lot about that. Uh, what our values are, things that we need to focus on. So if everyone's in line with that, pretty much everyone's pushing in the same direction and, and their their opinions, their thoughts, everything is definitely in line with what you're looking for. Um, but like there are those certain situations where, you know, there's something that you as a coach, you definitely want it to go this a certain way and that, but you have to make it sure that the players understand what that is. Um, but also give them a little bit of an opinion and voice in that as well, if that makes sense. Got time for one more if anybody has one. Yeah, Luke. Um, I think for us, I mean, once we kind of figure out wh what our team's going to be, I mean, it was it's a really important thing for such a short period of time. Um, I think special teams and then whoever has the best goalie on uh, on game day are probably your, your two biggest things. 
Um, so I think we, we worked on that a lot. Um, you know, and you also don't have a, you know, once you get rolling in the tournament, you don't have a ton of time. Um, but I think we just tried to, to figure out who was going to be on those groups. And for us, like, once we kind of pick who's on those groups, again, there's not a lot of time to get a ton of practice in. So once you've kind of picked your kids, um, you know, you kind of go from there. But I'd say we did it quite often. It, it's just a, it was a little scary sometimes, though, because y you get – when you only have for two weeks and they're kids, like, if you go too far and say too many things, like, forget it. All the creative, all the creativity's gone. They're overthinking everything, and then then it gets really weird out there. So like, and we saw that in one practice. I was like, oh, Joe was like, we're done. We're getting off the ice. And I think when you just let them be, almost because they know what they're doing, they know how to play the game, and you almost want to make it more like a pond hockey moment where you're just finding seams and people rather than overthinking if you're in the exact right position. But I do think it's like at for the U18 level because it's quite, it's very scary. But then it's so important, and you're like, well, how much do you push? We have a lot of conversations. <laughs> yeah, i just conclude on the U18 side. It's the worst part of the game when there's a penalty for either team. Because you're oftentimes more dangerous on the penalty kill than you are on the power play. Um, and that's in every game um, because you, 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 want it, you know it's going to come down to a power play goal, but you overcoach them and they, they become robots. And to your point, some of them have never, you know, their, their version of a power play is I just go get it and I go and I score. And now they're trying to actually pass it and, and be in sequence. So uh, the only consistent thing I found is that when we select the group, and sometimes we'll select a player and think, we, we think this kid's going to be a good power play kid. By the time the tournament comes around, she's sitting, sitting on the bench during the power plays <laughs> because she's not capable of doing it. And you got somebody that you never dreamed would be on the power play scoring two power play goals for you. So the U18s, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a crapshoot. I think for us, uh, that's probably one of the more difficult things that we have throughout this season is, is how to keep the, even just in practices, how to keep the, the your special teams up-tempo and that, um, and not having kids feel too comfortable and just kind of going through the motions on it. Um, so there's different things that we do throughout the season to kind of throw little wrinkles at them, um, to kind of keep it a little bit more competitive, um, some different things like that. To be honest with you, we don't even practice uh, PK that much. Uh, we have certain things that we like to do, but uh, we don't really practice our, our penalty kill a whole ton. Um, you know, other coaches do things different. We just find that that's something that's worked for us, I guess, over the years. Um, throughout the season, we, during practices and that, we try and put uh, players in different situations so they're comfortable um, in case their number gets called, right? Um, we don't want to just stick with certain players. We want to keep things fresh. Um, so we've put them in PK situations. We've put them in power play situations. We've had three power play units, you know, in practices and stuff, just trying to do different things to kind of keep those kids kind of motivated. Uh, like you said, how do you keep them motivated if they're not on a special team? Um, sometimes, you know, dangling that carrot or giving them an opportunity in a game um, that maybe you're, you're up by a few goals or down by a few goals or, or just finding those situations that you can kind of, you know, dangle that carrot in front of that kid and kind of keep them motivated to keep um, striving for that or pushing for that. And, and I think a lot of it, too, comes down to communication with them as well. Um, I think we all know that there's certain kids that you can see in, in PK roles and stuff like that. Um, you know, we certainly have a few that, you know, third, fourth liners that you can kind of see in, in a PK role, but they're not just, they're not there yet. So I think it's having that constant communication about, hey, I see in this role and stuff, but we still need to work on this before you get that opportunity. Can you continue to keep working on that? So just kind of keeping them motivated in different ways, I think. We're going to cut it here. Uh, again, congratulations to, to both staffs and your, your teams and programs. Uh, there is a lunch break here and then uh, issues by gender and division starting at 1.30. Make sure you check where your, uh, your meetings are. I think uh, on the women's side, they're in some different places. So. Thanks again for coming. Good job, fellas. Thanks.